Uh, so good evening. I'm John Sawyer. I'm the director of the Pulitzer Center. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I, you may have noticed I'm not in Dira Lakshmanan, our executive editor, who was really looking forward to doing this. And I had a terrible cold and no voice this morning. Stayed home, nursing it all day, and called about an hour ago, and she had nothing but a whisper. And so asked me to fill in for her. But uh, luckily, Indira is nothing if not prepared. So I have copious notes from Indira's questions. So I do my best to channel Indira here tonight. And of course, I have been uh, as much in awe of the work of Maggie and Michelle and her colleagues at the Associated Press as, as Indira and in all of our uh, team here at the Pulitzer Center. Uh, so it's a great, great honor uh, for us to, to be able to talk about this project and to be with, be with Maggie uh, tonight. Uh, this project, as I'm sure you've seen, uh, has gotten all kinds of recognition, uh, including a couple of weeks ago the Pulitzer Prize uh, for International Reporting. Uh, <laughs> And one of the things, this was a project that the Pulitzer Center uh, supported, uh, supported the team at the Associated Press, the reporting over the last year. And the, and I should say that the, the, there's, all, there's often confusion about the Pulitzer Center and the Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, we are not the same organization. We have the same ancestors. The, 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 I started the Pulitzer Center in 2006 after working many years at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which was owned by a grandson by the Pulitzer family, um, uh, the first grandson of the first Joseph Pulitzer. The Pulitzer Prizes, of course, have been administered by uh, Columbia University uh, for over 100 years uh, now. And so it's a great honor for us to have a Pulitzer Project win uh, this recognition from the, from the Pulitzer uh, Prizes. Um, and particularly, the, uh, one of the things that we stress uh, a great deal at the Pulitzer Center is is uh, giving, uh, making sure that voices from the regions we're reporting on are represented. So the fact that the Maggie and her colleagues at the Associated Press, three Arab journalists reporting on the region for uh, the amazing organization that the Associated Press is, uh, made this doubly powerful uh, to us. Uh, I know you know Maggie's distinguished career over the last uh, 15 years plus, uh, based in Cairo, covering all of the Middle East, uh, the work that she's done uh, with the Associated Press and for other organizations. Uh, so I want to go uh, quickly to, to your thoughts, to, to uh, hearing about uh, the project. I should say that, that we're going to do, in the interest of getting as many and as diverse questions as possible, we're going to try the note card route so that my colleagues will be handing out cards as we go through the discussion. And then, and, and if you have questions, I hope you will, uh, just jot them down and, and they'll be bringing them up and, and we'll um, answer do the best we can to answer those questions. Maggie, I think we should start just to set the, the background for us. Of the, for those who don't know all of the details, many here are expert in this, some are not. Uh, on the Yemen conflict, the, the origins of the conflict, um, how did it unfold, why, the role of the Saudi government, our government, uh, in that conflict? Um, the war did not start in 2015. It was mainly a result of a failed transition. Um, this is how many Yemenis uh, perceive this. It started since um, the uprising that led to the ouster of uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, the man who ruled Yemen for 30 years. Um, what came next was uh, politics of revenge. He was al he allied with his own enemies, who are the Houthi militias. Uh, he fought them for six years, uh, and it's called six wars, from 2004 to 2010. He allied with them um, to take over most of uh, the north part of Yemen, and then started to move down, uh, forcing the government that he was uh, led by President Hadi, uh, who was his vi vice president, um, to escape the country and to seek support from Saudi Arabia. And the role of Saudi Arabia started 2015 after Houthis reached Aden at the very south of the country. 
So Saudis at that time, in the eyes of many Yemenis, it was uh, going through its own transition from one king to the other, to the rise of the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, it started to um, uh, form an alliance of Arab countries, nine, including uh, um, mainly it's Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. I mean, mainly. It's not, um, you, there, there aren't many other influential players in this coalition. What the Saudis did to get rid of the Houthis is just bomb all of Yemen. And they went everywhere with a huge uh, air campaign um, targeting everything, that, including civilian, uh, uh, civilian uh, targets, uh, schools, markets, uh, hospitals. Um, and uh, the disaster uh, led to uh, tens of thousands of killings and, and many people injured. So the war started because of that failed transition and got worse because of, U of the Saudi intervention. And the US supported Saudi Arabia from day one with um, uh, military uh, advisors sitting in Riyadh um, who always say we are not involved in targeting. We are trying to make it good by not hitting the no target list. So they have no target list of uh, uh, around 23,000 targets. These are schools, hospitals, and others. Uh, but in reality, it's not working. And they're targeting civilians. And that happened during all the, the, the first three and a half years. And now we're seeing decline in uh, targeting of civilians um, in most of Yemen. Um, the aid that US gave uh, to uh, Saudis also was air-to-air -air refueling. Uh, in addition to billions of dollars of arms. And um, that made Saudi Arabia, uh, the United US is uh, seen as complicit in that war. What we also looked into is a different kind of support uh, and different kind of war that's happening in the southern part of the country where uh, the Emiratis are uh, Aligned with uh, with the U.S. in a war against terrorism, and our investigations found that U.S. is involved in um, interrogating detainees who were arrested by uh, militias backed by the Emiratis and tortured to extract confessions. And these confessions are used to feed into the the drone campaign in targeting uh, suspected militants. So U.S. has different other roles, uh, including the war against terrorism, and it's very, uh, it's a close alliance with the Emiratis and the southern part of Yemen. So, I mean, as with many conflicts, I think is my recollection, the expectation at the beginning was that this was going to be brief and yeah. easy, and that it was going to be over. And, yeah. and now we're three and a half years into it. And I think in a way, maybe the expectation of what was likely to happen and the assumption that the Saudis and us behind them, that surely they would, they would prevail quickly that may have contributed to the to the slow response by some media organizations. So, to tell me, tell us what you what what your view of the media coverage early on was like, and how and how you approached your own reporting to how to get to tell the story. So, the idea that there was going to be a quick war, uh, it's very true. The Saudis underestimated the capacities and the capabilities of the Houthis. They didn't see the entire Yemeni army is under their hands because, the, because Saleh controls the army and Saleh allied with them, so everything in their hands. So they totally underestimated um, the, the, this, this side. And they overestimated Hadi. They thought that he has any kind of control of any forces on the ground, and that didn't happen. So that's how the war is dragging, because the, it's miscalculations on all sides. But when it comes to the media, I think um, there wasn't much attention to the impact of the campaign on the country on all levels. Um, there wasn't much attention to the US role. When media, when um, rights groups uh, and some journalists started to write about the involvement of US in this war, then started to attract some attention. And then it's 
at, uh, and with the killing of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, there was a momentum because, and this I think is problematic in coverage of Yemen, is you see this conflict through Saudi Arabia, in, through um, exposing Saudi Arabia. It's not through, this is, there is a conflict here in Yemen and Saudi Arabia is part of it. So when Jamal Khashoggi happened, there was this big momentum and big push and uh, many people started to go back and see what's happening there, I think, yeah. In your own first involvement, this is going back when we cut coverage of the humanitarian crisis, the famine, sort of some of the initial stories that you did. Can, you began to do your reporting. As you began your reporting, yeah, some yeah, of yeah. the first reporting stories that you worked on. Yeah, the first, um, the stories we did before that year, which is last year, is more about documenting these uh, atrocities. I mean, the killings of civilians in markets. Like, you have 100 people killed in, uh, in a few minutes. And... Uh, <clears throat> Hard to tell those stories. Hey. Right. And we did a story about uh, <clears throat> so I go back to your question, <laughs> which is much easier. Um, I think it's easier because um, it's different when you see um, mass killings, and then you see um, thinking about the, I mean, the complicity of the governments behind it, or the statements that they're making, sort of the misrepresentation of what's happening versus what you're seeing on the ground. Yeah, that, we that saw kind of the story missing uh, so many elements. We saw. Um, I think a lot of focus on Saudi Arabia, and that wasn't everything. Um, when you speak to Yemenis, um, it's about um, the Houthis uh, more, actually. It's, uh, they're making their life very hard. Um, uh, all of this about, um, they actually lost uh, the basics, like, Sending kids to school, uh, finding a good um, hospital when you get sick, getting a salary. Um, since September 2016, uh, there are no salaries. So you have a million people uh, who are government employees, and they just don't, don't get salaries. So you have people who are considered somehow protected and middle class They're going down and joining these mass um, uh, masses of poor people. and. Um, that's it. And in terms of organizing your team, your colleagues, and, and the, I mean, facing tremendous constraints in terms of access to parts of the country, very difficult to get to yeah. those countries. And, and and you were developing. You had a you had a, a, a team of stringers, other social people in the country working with you. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about how that worked? Just the mechanics of organizing the coverage. We had, um, we are a team of three people. Um, uh, Nariman Mufti, she's a photographer, and Mad is a videographer. And uh, because he is the Yemeni guy in this team, he was very, like, important in guiding us through the safest way in operating in Yemen. Uh, we needed to go to so many cities. And um, the way, the roads connecting these cities are manned by so many checkpoints. We travel as a family. And uh, as a woman, I cover up my face, and a man also. And we hardly speak during these times, crossing one checkpoint to the other. We try to keep low profile as much as we can in order to be able to access as many places as we can. Um, we try hard to uh, protect the people we speak to. So we go to their own houses. Sometimes we ask them to get out of the their areas to speak to us somewhere else. Um, if you look at the map in Yemen, you find uh, only two functioning airports in the southern and the eastern part of the country. Sana'a has been closed. The airport in Sana'a, that's the main one, has been closed since 2016. 
and that makes life really hard for everyone trying to get into the country. It's because you travel like 10 hours between <coughs> cities. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of planning, um, a lot of uh, <laughs> scenarios, like we put different scenarios to how to spend, how much time to spend here, when to live there, who to talk to, it's, it's a lot of planning, yeah. One of, the, one of the stories that I felt was um, really affecting was uh, about the, the, the young boy who, who went to join um, the, the AQ, the, the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and then his family, trying, his parents trying to find him and, and, and what happened. Tell us about reporting that story and how you, know, how you went about it, how you got to the story to be able to tell it. Uh, this is a story about uh, a boy who's 15 year old. Uh, he lives in uh, a governorate called Shabwa. And this is one of the main uh, places where IQEP is active. And as you know, Qaeda in Yemen um, has a very strong base in, 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 in the country since 2006 um, and 2009, actually. So um, the boy story. Um, uh, we heard about it from a relative who told us, have you heard about this family that a drone, U.S. drone strike killed their seven members? They were in one car. Um, it was one day uh, the boy disappeared, and the father kept looking for him, asking relatives everywhere, and at last he found out that his son has been, uh, he fled to join AQEP in the mountains. So the father um, had his son, relatives, all of them in the car, seven of them driving at night, and they got all uh, shot before they reached the boy. They were very close to him. Um, this story, uh, thanks to our editors, have uh, given us really interesting ideas on how to write that story. So we did it like minute by minute journey. Since the time he woke up in the morning till the minute he heard a strike, and then he found out that his family has been killed. Um, we went to the Pentagon with our story, asking questions about, can you look into this and tell us uh, what went wrong? And the answer was, actually, it's these are legitimate targets. Today, there was a, I, th I think today or yesterday, there was a report by um, US military saying that all uh, strikes that happened in Yemen are um, include no civilians, and... Uh, no civilians at, at all. all. They, they claim is that no civilians At all. Killed. They recognize others in other countries, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, but not in Libya, and not in Yemen. This is the Pentagon? It's, this yeah. is the same today? That was just, I think, yesterday or today. And um, our own count, we found third of the targets were civilians or pro-government troops. And it was really hard uh, to, to do that story because we had to call so many people in so many places and try to, um, like, here there was a drone strike, so let's try to find out what happened here. And we find um, tribal leaders and uh, villagers and um, shepherds, and we speak to them, and they send us pictures, and they send us documents and letters and testimonies from the villagers and from the community leaders to testify that these people were civilians. They were just, um, they had nothing to do with AQEP. And, uh, but it's not clear until now why US never recognized any civilian deaths in Yemen while they recognize it somewhere else. Yeah. I think this is our next story. I think we need to find out more about this. In, in, in document in a situation like that where the government is, is flatly denying something that your own reporting suggests is, is true, that it's happened, um, see, you have the eyewitness accounts, but you get, you're gathering those accounts. Are you also working with other organizations to, to document who also can corroborate what you we, found? We haven't done a work with other groups, but we have documents. We had certificates. Uh, of, of this person graduated from that school and from that university, and he had a certificate from his work. He was working in this place, and we had uh, witnesses from the community themselves. And uh, so this is how you're building this um, uh, story through documents and from the witnesses, and uh, it's proof that uh, these people were not involved in militancy. Yeah. <coughs> 
There was another uh, really difficult story, difficult to report, difficult to read, uh, about trying to get to the front lines along the western coast in the town of Coca. Um, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hoja. 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 I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Hoja. Uh, tell us about that story. How you know, and just the how you got there, what you found, how you how you reported it, how you went about reporting it. Um, so. Sometimes we make decisions uh, based on you have risk and you have outcome. And is it worth it? Is it worth to take the risk? And this was, um, as you know, the, the latest uh, uh, hotspot in Yemen is, is Hudaida port. It's the most important port because here is most of the humanitarian aid get to the country. And uh, in Hudaida, you see the worst scenes of um, <coughs> famine. It's very hard. Um, the place where the witness role of the journalist, I think, is there's no substitute for that. Yeah. But, but one of the hardest things. That yeah, it's a, it's a place nobody went before because. Uh, Let me ask a different kind of question. Having done these really, really hard things um, and told those stories, what do you what do you see as the impact of that kind of reporting? When you when you look at the you know, policies policies of the United States, the European Union, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, whatever. I mean, I think when it comes to um, impact on uh, policies, we had some. Something you know, we can say there was some impact. Um, there was um, we did a story about uh, the looting of aid, and um, so we had billions of dollars of aid going to Yemen, and uh, sometimes the aid actually gets into the country. I mean, yes, there is blockade, but the aid gets in. But then after it gets in, it gets looted, and. UN agencies are held hostage by the forces on the ground. They cannot speak because if you speak, you lack, you can't access the country. So they just witness, they look at their aid being looted, taken from um, from them. They can't speak about it, and it's a very strange situation where you have this all happening and nobody's writing about it. So when we wrote about this. Uh, the, the World Food Program uh, came out next day with a very strong statement about how the Houthis are looting the aid from the mouth of the hungry. And um, it was one of a very yeah, few moments where the UN agencies stood and made it clear that uh, uh, we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna stay silent about what's happening there. But it was only the WFP because we know about many other issues happening, and they are not speaking. And uh, for them, when you speak to some of the top uh, UN uh, officials, they say the most important is to deliver. And even if you deliver, meaning does it reach the people? It's not clear. I mean, there is a very, there is a, is there a problem in this whole model of, of delivering food baskets, and they get lost in the middle, and. Uh, so that was good for us to see some impact that we are helping somehow UN agencies to speak of. Um, other stories that we had were like writing about torture in uh, prisons in Yemen and especially sexual abuse. Because um, the Emiratis uh, use uh, detainees as agents. So how to turn a detainee into an informant is through sexual abuse. They sexually abuse people and they film them and then use it as a way to press them to work for them. And this has been happening. And when we wrote about this, uh, we managed to get some drawings uh, smuggled out from one of the prisons that showed somehow what's happening there. And um, after we did that story, we had dozens of prisoners then released 
and they were actually looking and searching for the man who made these drawings. However, until now, there are prisons and there are people being tortured and prisons are not over. I mean, it's not closed. So yeah, I mean, somehow you feel you get some impact, uh, but it's not over. It's just, uh, it's very small compared to the so many things happening there. And do you have a sense of uh, where we're headed in, in Yemen, where the Yemeni people are headed in the next six months or a year? What's, what's like what we're likely to see? I think it's a stalemate. There's no uh, progress. It's just uh, people, um, the situation on the ground is getting worse. Um, it's, you have food in the market, as my, you might have read before. Food in the market, but people do not have the ability to buy the food. Uh, they are, have no cash. And they wait for the aid, and the aid is not coming. And um, when it comes to US role, I think many people think that the war can, can actually come to an end starting from here. If US put heavy pressure on the coalition, and then the coalition like ease up or declare an end of that campaign. But that's not the end, because you still have civil war. You still have forces fighting each other on the ground. So the thing for Yemen, it needs heavy support for a political solution. Power sharing. They can share power and they can um, move on from that stage. But it doesn't seem to be, uh, there doesn't seem to be any progress right now. And, um, and any impetus for that from Europeans or from other Arab states? You find the Arab states now either with, uh, between two camps, either with right. the Saudis or the Qataris and the Iranians. It's split. It's heavily polarized. There isn't a single country or a single government that's interested in helping the Yemenis. It's uh, totally out of it. So um, when it comes to Europeans, um, you have most of the European countries supporting Saudis with weapons. I mean, it's business and it's working well. And that's the thing about this war is that uh, many people, are, many parties are making profit out of it, including the local militias. Lots of black markets, smuggling, and as long as you have so many prof making profit, I mean, who has the interest of ending it? So I'm, I'm speaking, I'm, I'm reflecting the thoughts of many people I know in Yemen who have no hope for uh, real peace unless there is a big push for a solution. And what happened in Sweden in uh, December when UN envoy brought uh, representatives from different parties to sit together, they spoke of very small steps concerning one place called Hudaida, and they even failed to achieve it. It didn't work. Because the Houthis say, I mean, if we can't, uh, why would we leave Hudaida? For us, it's the milking cow. It's the cow. That, it's, it's, it's giving them revenues. It's giving them access to the sea. It's, it's good. Why should they, they leave it? So there should be a bigger and comprehensive uh, political solution. This is what many people think. I'm going to turn to your question shortly, so I, I hope you're writing some down that we can share. The, uh, but first, I want to, this is a totally different um, subject, but I'm curious as to what it's like to have been you in the reporting from the Middle East based in Cairo, 15 years. You think back 15 years, that's the 2004 or so. That's I mean, kind of the arc of, you know, that's about the time when the, the Americans just began to realize that that we didn't have a clue what we'd gotten into in Iraq, where we'd gone through this process also of thinking it was going to be a very quick, wonderful exercise. And, and then you went through the Arab Spring and, and Cairo and everything else. And tell us about your own trajectory as a journalist in, in that region, given everything that's happened. I mean, I'm one of many um, Egyptian and Arab journalists in, in AP and the Associated Press, uh, for many years we have been rotating, going from one country to the other. Uh, we went to cover Iraq um, during the civil wars and the uprisings that happened in 2011. We moved from one country to the other. And we saw things going very high, like high hopes among many people, and then going so down after 
the end of this um, era with uh, many different ways of um, of setbacks. And um, yeah, I mean, Yemen is very special. I think it's very different from all of what I have seen. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, um, the people somehow have been going through a lot. Um, have they, since 1994, they had civil war. Uh, they had six wars with the Houthis. Uh, they had a very strong southern movement. Um, it wasn't stable. I mean, it was never stable. But at least they had some kind of life. Uh, it was secure somehow. And, um, and even if after... Even up uh, until 2015, even that late? Maybe before up this, until yeah. 2011. <coughs> And then, even after the, even af, if they blame Saleh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, the leader who ruled them for 30 years, they blame him for all what happened. They still remember that under him, life was much better. So they are torn between these ideas, and how to blame someone, and but he was actually better than what's happening now. So for me, I think uh, Yemen is very, very unique experience, and. Uh, uh, we never spend an entire year working on one project, and uh, we're really, well, I'm sorry, really never, good. never an entire year on one story, one, one yeah, right. in one story. Mm -hmm. I mean, that never happened before, and uh, that gave us a chance to go really deep into all the areas that haven't been covered, and uh, there were many, and still many until now. Um, I think Yemen is forgotten in many levels. It's forgotten in international media. Unless there is a Saudi thing in it, you know, um, it's forgotten on the stories and how to look into different angles. Um, it's you feel like there is a season for Yemen, you know. It comes there is a season where people are very interested, and then they forgot about it for a long time. So it's good to be there for a year, so you can. It's not seasons. It's just it's, it's something you do for a very long time. Yeah. So I should say in that regard that um, the, this idea of having a whole year, this is sort of uh, our engagement in this topic from the Pulitzer Center standpoint. Mike Hudson, who's here in the corner and the extraordinary editor from Associated Press who worked with us, came to us and actually before we met, before we knew Maggie, first Mike proposing projects, um, year, similar year-long project that we did in support of AP reporters in Myanmar, which also extraordinary um, reporting, and then and then follow that with the, the initiative with with uh, Maggie and her colleagues. And I think that people don't um, they don't appreciate if you're not in the media just how rare that is the the opportunity to have to have uh, extended time to actually think about how you would organize a team. And, 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 and work, and the three of you, of course, in the region, but also all your colleagues, both in Cairo and Yemen and New York, that, that were the people in Washington who, who could think about how to do this project. So, so other thoughts on that, that kind of model of, of reporting? I think it's a very, very good model. Uh, we call it slow journalism. It's very good because we need it in, uh, in a newsroom that's you're so busy with breaking news, with jumping from one story to the other without really going deep. Um, I think it hurts the story sometimes that you don't, you just report the surface and you don't go deep. You don't understand what's really happening. Especially if you are not from this country, you wouldn't really, I mean, it's very good to really spend time in one country and to go there several times and to build up network of, of sources and of um, those who can trust you and give you documents, especially if you're doing investigative work, you really need to see documents. And it comes by time, over time, when people open up and start to give you something. It doesn't happen easy, yeah. I'm going to try one more time on the idea of what it's like to be you and the work that you do. Um, you're based in Cairo. You have a daughter, yeah. right? How old? 13. 13. So she's experienced a lot through you, and sort of you're going off, coming back. Yeah. What are the conversations that you have with her? What are her thoughts about what you do? Well, she's not really happy <laughs> with what I'm doing, and she doesn't like me traveling and leaving her. And uh, that's, um, we always have a kind of, uh, no, you're not going, first reaction. And then 
Okay, I'm going for only one week, and then we negotiate that week after I'm back, after I'm in Yemen. I'll call her, I'm going to stay a few more days. So it's a, a, a process of negotiations. And, but uh, yeah, she doesn't like journalism. She doesn't like uh, any not, of this. Not, she's not a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> He hates it, so. <laughs> Usually, I, my experience is that it kind of works. It's pretty extreme. Either they not, have no desire to ever be a journalist, or that's all they want to do. Great. Thank you. All right, let's see. Um, here's a question. Can you talk more about the role of the United Nations agencies in the peacekeeping operations? There is no real peacekeeping operation right now. I mean, it was part of the Hodeida Agreement. We're going to deploy uh, 75 monitors to monitor the ceasefire. And until now, there was no withdrawal based on the plan. You have to withdraw and to leave the city and pull out. And it didn't happen. So the monitors until now weren't activated. I mean, nothing happened on the ground about this. Yeah. So no peacekeeping forces in Yemen. Would there be a role for peacekeeping forces? Would that be a, would that be a good response based on what you've seen of peacekeeping forces elsewhere? I think so. Yeah. I think so because, um, well, there's deep mistrust between Yemenis themselves. And maybe when you have an outsider in the middle, that would be a way to, to, to separate between them. Um, but it has to be tested. Uh, I don't know what would be the reaction on the ground. The, this is a question about Iran. The U.S. has justified its involvement in Yemen uh, because of concerns about the Iranian influence over the Houthis. Uh, is this concern valid? Is there evidence of, uh, strong evidence of Iranian activity in Yemen? I mean, this is one of the biggest questions we are still working on because uh, it's a mystery. I mean, there isn't a very clear Iranian role on this war. U.S., I mean, the, the Saudis accuse the Houthis of being a proxy. The Iranians are denying. Iran is also denying. But to what extent the Iranians are playing a role is, is not clear. But if you check the, the panel of experts report that was released earlier uh, this year, you will find them uh, for the first time uh, documenting that the Iranians are supporting the Houthis with millions of dollars worth fuel every month. And they, they take the fuel, they sell it, they finance the war through that way. But this is not the only thing. We are hearing unconfirmed reports of other support, of military support, of technology transfer, and all of this, and having experts on the ground. But this is something that we should work on, and no one has uh, like found an answer to it. Work on further documentation of it, or work on, as opposed to just confronting the Iranians to actually document the. To extent. find out what extent the Iranians are the really involved is. in this. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, this is another question on, on, on aid coming in. What other, what other instances of aid diversion uh, or compromise, corrupted aid, have you seen? Uh, is that occurring all over the country? Are they particular regions where it's more pronounced? And this is an unrelated question, but are there Saudi troops on the ground, or is, the, is their fighting only via the air? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to aid, uh, there are so many ways on different levels, even the manipulation of data. So you have um, those who decide on which parts of the country need the most aid. These researchers, when they come on the ground in the Houthi-controlled areas, they are not free to collect data and information. They're controlled. And I know one of these in instances is that in the city of Sada, which is the home of Houthis, um, there is exaggerations of the data. So on the map, you find Sada, a famine, a, po a pocket of famine. But when you speak to the aid officials, they tell you, no, this is not the truth. It's not a pocket of famine. Based on that map, they distribute the aid. So Saada takes a big share of the aid. Where does the aid go if it's not famine? So the answer is the Houthis take over it and they sell it in the market. There are so many different other ways, like even what they call wash, like uh, water and sanitation. That's a program that supports water stations and uh, 
and all of this. So um, even uh, the hygiene gets the, gets get distributed, uh, gets sold in the black market. The drugs, the medicine, um, tents, everything can be sold. I mean, um, there is no oversight, and that's the major issue, is that UN agencies are not free to move around. They cannot move to monitor the distribution of aid as they should. They are partner uh, partners to local groups that are the ones responsible for distribution. And these local groups are affiliated to the Houthis or other parties of this conflict. They are not um, independent. So when you give the aid to groups that are controlled by party of this conflict, there is no way you can guarantee it's going to be delivered to the right people. So it's a lack of oversight. It's a restriction of movement. It's uh, all, all of this mix. Yeah. And the question about Saudi troops on the ground, are there ground troops or not? Uh, what's known is that the Yemenis are the ones who are used in this war. There are very few and very limited non-Yemeni presence except for the Sudanese. I mean, they have Sudanese troops, especially in Hodeida. But other than that, you won't find a different nationalities, just Yemenis. The question about ISIS in Yemen. Um, is it your perception that the group is particularly active or strong uh, in Yemen? Um, because of uh, AQEP and uh, it's really strong in the country um, and it has uh, deep enmity with ISIS. There was attempts by ISIS to have a strong presence, but it failed. Right now in Baida, uh, if you check the local news it's, and speak to people there in Baida, especially in Baida, you find internal fighting between AQEP and ISIS. Other than that, there is no presence of ISIS anywhere else. Um, they're very limited in numbers and uh, locations. Sure, but this is, in your opinion, is the mass hunger, is it a result of economic uh, conditions or of food scarcity? not food scarcity. They don't it's, have resources uh, to buy. You have so many restrictions uh, on, on the country that uh, everything is very, very expensive. The food prices are really high. Uh, Yemen imports 90% uh, of its needs. So if you put restrictions on the ports, mm -hmm. then you are making it very, very expensive to import the food. So you increase the price of the food and people already don't have any income, any source of income. So they can't actually buy the food. But it's there. When you go there, you have money, you can buy food. But for them, you can't. Interesting question. What sense do you have of Yemeni's uh, perception of Americans? Um, Americans as, an, as, as people? Are, no, are the government people, are, uh, either one? I mean, do they, maybe, I'm not sure that, many, whether they make a distinction or not. Yeah, I think they are, uh, they believe that this war can just stop tomorrow if U.S. government decided it's over. And they believe that um, the Saudis uh, can stop the war if U.S. decided this is over. So this is their perception, is that it's in the hands of the outsiders. However, they know also that if the war stopped from outside, they still have to deal with the Houthis and other groups. Because, you know, everybody's armed. It's, it's, it's heavily, heavily armed groups on the ground everywhere. And uh, the fear of the Yemenis is after that is over, <coughs> they're going to be split into pieces, not even north and south as before 1990. Before 1990, it was two nations and two countries. They are even worried of splitting it into different regions. Um, and But I don't know, I mean, they have no, um, they hope that there is some kind of international support for them um, and to stop this war and bring them together. If there were three or four, if it, if it split into more than two, so the, the Houthis, the, the government side, then who else? What, what, what would be other, other? You have, if you look at the map, you have uh, the huge Hadramaut um, governorate. This in itself um, has very unique identity, its own identity. It does not see itself as on the same camp as 
Aden. So you have Aden, Lahg, that's one thing. And is that region, has that been spared much of the conflict or yeah, not? Yeah, so it has. It's, it's okay. But uh, at one point, uh, AQEP controlled the main city in Hadramaut, which is Mokalla. It uh, occupied it for one year. Um, and then we wrote, we did a story about how the coalition struck a deal with the QEP in order to leave these cities in order, uh, in return for some incentives. And um, so it has been spared destruction, it's intact. Um, but this is very, very unique uh, place that has its own identity. It sees itself as independent from the South. What the Emiratis also did, and I just want to highlight this, is that they created deep divisions in the South between different cities. Like you have Aden, Lahk on one side. You have Dala on the other side. These, these divisions were because uh, the Emiratis heavily backed militias from one single city against the others. And the detainees belonged to another city. So they created enmities between them. And this is why when we say they're going to be splitting along these lines, it's because of this bad intervention on different levels. They, they intervened in, they supported one group against the other. Yeah. Another interesting question. Being Egyptian, did you, in your view, did that help or hamper your work in Yemen? It helped a lot because uh, Egyptians in the region uh, are known with their movies and songs and culture, and all Arab countries love us. So <laughs> when I open my mouth and speak Egyptian accent, they just love you, and they smile, and they're amazing. And so it made my life easy, being an Egyptian. Uh, they don't also, I think one of the very so few. There was, there was a brief period when I was young when people thought that about Americans and I traveled a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> So um, I think one of the good things the Egyptian government did, it did not um, work with the coalition. It did not send troops. So it's not complicit in it's that not sense. Complicit. It's not seen as complicit. Yeah, and the Yemenis do not see us as part of, the, of this war. So that was good. Some scholars suggest that the United States should support uh, Saudis uh, on the war and use this so-called favor to pressure the Saudis to find a political solution that includes all Yemeni parties. Is, there, is that possible that we could do something like that, that we could leverage our support for the Saudis to actually push them to be constructive, to play a constructive role inside Yemen? I think this is what the Yemenis think. They think that it's in the hands of US to pressure Saudis to, f to first stop the air campaign, second to find a way to bring them together. Saudi Arabia invested a lot, a lot of money in Yemen. They had, they bribed every single tribe for many, many years under Saleh. I mean, they had something called a special committee that gave monthly salaries to tribal leaders to keep them loyal. They had a lot of ability to bring, bring them together if they want. But now, I'm not sure after all of what happened, uh, they still have this leverage inside the country. They might have that with the South part, with the government part, but I'm not sure about the areas that have been heavily impacted by the airstrikes. This is the question that goes back to the United States, uh, asking how could the presidential candidates in the United States today, I guess all Democrats at this point, uh, take effective action to help Yemen? It's once again putting pressure on the coalition to uh, find uh, a comprehensive political solution that's based on sh sharing power. I mean, this is this seems to be the only way. I mean, the Houthis are not going anyway, and the government is there. It's over. I mean, they have to find a way to live together, and the only way is to have a roadmap to uh, start together a, a power sharing uh, agreement. But um, there ha should be some heavy international. Uh, pressure and U.S. started. Yeah. What about the efforts in the Congress, particularly the House, to the resolutions to stop U.S. support? Is that uh, effective? Do you think is that um, the means of sort of galvanizing opinion on this? I think um, 
based on, on opinions of many people who are more expert in this, it's uh, symbolic. Uh, there's no way uh, to overrule uh, the veto uh, on, on the, res the resolution. There is no way to stop the war until, I mean, to, to, to stop U.S. support to the war unless the president himself is, is allied with it. So um, it seems to be very symbolic. Has there been, in your view, enough reporting about the, the identification of arms suppliers uh, in Yemen, where the, where the arms are coming from, the role the various people are playing, middlemen, whatever? Is that That needs a lot of, of reporting. It's uh, many countries, uh, many European countries, um, and the Iranians, if they are really supporting the Houthis with weapons, it needs a lot of work. To identify it, I think uh, there was a piece about Italian weapons. Uh, I, there was another piece about the U.S. missiles, and um, but we need a lot of work. Uh, I think. Yeah. What, what, there's been a fair amount of reporting in recent years about the the role of climate change and desertification, and other things, in, in, in driving conflict. And do, do you have thoughts on that as to the significance of that in Yemen? I think we're just, trying to, we're just discussing this issue about water. I mean, it's one of the major issues that are impacting uh, the lives of people. Is um, uh, people, Yemen is already dry. It's a dry. Uh, it's running out of water. It's um, the pollution is one of the major uh, drivers of the cholera outbreaks and all disease. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's one of the major issues, yeah. This is a question about the, um, the ceasefire in Hudaydah. If, if, if that collapses and the coalition attacks the city, what would the impact be on the humanitarian situation there, do you think? It's going to be much, much worse because um, you have, uh, this is the main access to humanitarian aid so the alternative would be many other ways and many other roads that are not as close to the north. The north part of Yemen is where 70% of the population lives. And this is where most of the UN agencies are targeting. They're targeting the area. And that area, the only access it has is with the Red Sea, with Hudaydah. The, what are the alternatives? This is a question we ask UN all the time before <laughs> the ceasefire happened. What do you think of the alternative? Mm -hmm. And the options that are left are Aden is uh, the port, but it's very hard because of the way the, the roads from Aden to the north is like 10, 12 hour drive. And um, practically speaking, this is not the solution. So it's going to make things much, much worse. Um, Hodaida is one of the heavily populated uh, governorates in Yemen. Uh, we already seen these uh, scenes of people who are uh, escaping from their houses and they have nothing. And the problem with UN also is does not have a clear idea about how to take care of these people. You know, the displaced do not have camps. There are no displaced camps. You have people running to their house, to their relatives, and those who do not have relatives just stay in the open. Um, so I mean, you have more displaced people. You have more um, disease because in displacement, the chances that you, 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 you have any other, like cholera or any other disease, much higher, more chances of malnutrition. So it's going to increase and make things really, really bad. And how many people are we talking about in, in greater the data? It's around uh, it's million, million and a half. Yeah, I think so. It's, uh, because there were waves of displacement. How many people left inside is something that's changing. Because people sometimes come back. Sometimes because when there's a ceasefire, people return. Um, so it's moving. Things are not stable, yeah. Uh, in, this, in the last few days, uh, part of what we do at the Pulitzer Center, we, we put a lot of energy into taking great journalists and journalism, such as uh, Maggie has been working on, out into schools and universities. So you've been out at University of Chicago and, and high schools in, in Chicago and also here in the D.C. area. And what's that been like? Sort of, and you're talking to you know, students who you know, have 
limited or maybe no knowledge of, of Yemen. Yeah. So, so how, is, you know, how have you gone about sharing this story and your work? I think it was um, really interesting to see them uh, listening well and giving questions that reflect them understanding and curiosity about what's happening. Uh, we were careful about not making them feel guilty because it's not healthy. I mean, you can be sympathetic and you show solidarity but not feeling guilty. And that was something important because this is also a Yemen role in the war. I mean, Yemenis are responsible for this. It's Their leaders are also responsible. It's not only a U.S. mistake and Saudi's mistake. So, so that, that was something we keep in the back of the mind. I think they were very interested in the story about the child soldiers because they can see the other children going through very different lives. And um, they ask so many questions about it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think I was telling you before that this is really interesting to see. It's very important to open up the students to outsiders to come and share these stories and, and see the world from the from others, yeah. And what was their what was their approach on the child soldiers, the recruitment story? How did how did that how did you handle that <coughs> question? Um, so we started to uh, speak about how um, these children uh, uh, have been recruited, have been turning into a killing machine, and they went. One guy asked me, uh, "Were they brainwashed?" I said, "Yes." This is how this, this kid turned into a killing machine in one month because they take him to a religious course, isolate him from his family, and um, give him very clear, I mean, repetitive messages about this is a war against uh, Israel, Zionist America. Those enemies are um, enemies of God. Uh, if you die, you go to heaven. All these messages, it's this what's happening to thousands of children in the very north of Yemen. And mm. the questions by the children were there about were they brainwashed, how they changed from being a child to a soldier. Yeah. Right. Well, it's so important, I think, to be out engaging people in these stories and these issues that, that you know are affected by us or or you affect them and all too often we don't make those connections and it's been our belief that that's you have to do that community by community school by school university by university and in the fractured political environment we're in uh, we actually find that, that that schools community colleges universities are are places where you still can have conversations about these issues and and, and, and openness to uh, facts and 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 uh, deeply reported um, authoritative um, assessments of what's going on in places like Yemen. So we're, we're at the end of our time. Thank you for all that you've shared. Thank you for the, all of the great questions. Um, I, I, haven't, I, I haven't done this note card thing in a while. It's very effective. We'll do it more often. So thank you for making me think I had smart questions. And we're going to have a reception immediately afterwards, just, just behind, and, and I think an opportunity to talk further with Maggie, and, and I'm being reminded all over the room that we, if you look at PulitzerCenter.org Yemen survey on your phone, uh, we're trying something else new tonight, uh, where if you just, there's like a four, very short four question survey, um, what you think about events like this, this particular event, uh, it's helpful to us because we, um, we, we do something like six or 700 events in schools and, and places like this every year and we're always we're trying to make them as, as um, effective and impactful as we can. So your feedback is really important uh, and we, I'm so grateful to all of you for coming to, to skirting the storms around us and, and do stay and continue the conversation. And Maggie, thank you, thank you so much for all this. Thank you. And, and, and thank you. Thank also the, the Associated Press for the, um, their dedication to this kind of work uh, all over the world. So Mike, take that back to all of your colleagues in New York and around the world. Deeply grateful for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you.